All right, uh, Ross, thanks for driving down this morning from Miami. It's a couple hour drive and so you got four hours, but I think your story uh, as a scientist with Bonefish Tarpon Trust and the conservation that you guys are, are doing and, uh, and what you, we all had that meeting the other day. It was kind of a fundraiser, but it was also a video of what you recently found this uh, bonefish aggregation. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but I, I thought it was really important to maybe talk about what I find really interesting is your life living on a sailboat you know, and, and your work as a scientist and you never get to hear what scientists do and how they do their job. Uh, and Nikki thought, man, living on a sailfish, you must be the best fisherman in the world. You're a scientist. You study these fish. You got to catch more fish than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish that was the case. Uh, but I, I like it more than anybody else. And, uh, I, I need good eyes. I bet Nikki, you probably have some pretty Pretty good eyes for seeing fish. Better than my father's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the scientists we work with. I mean, he he can see everything. I, you know, so much so that I didn't I didn't believe him when he was pointing out fish until they, they were you know, run by the boat. And I even got contacts and all these other eye treatments. Just trying to, to help, trying to get it who, better. Who yeah. is that? Uh, Nick Castillo. He's really? a PhD student doing the pharmaceutical work. Uh, he he was a guy. He still is a guide up in Isla Mirada as well as, as doing his PhD. Very cool. He's got yeah. great eyes. Oh my gosh! Like. Yeah, doesn't do, a fish will not go by him without him seeing it. Yeah. Really, that's pretty cool. Yeah, good asset to have when you need to catch a lot of fish for science. Yeah. So, um, how long have you been working with with Bonefish Tarpon Trust? It's, it's an organization that's been around like twenty five years or so. Yeah, yeah. I started working with BTT uh, officially in twenty seventeen. Um, I, I was a part of some of the work they did early on with bonefish when I was uh, twenty two. That's kind of how I connected with the organization. And then when I was doing my PhD as well. I was a part of a, one of their re original research grants to map the spatial temporal changes in the decline of bonefish. So it's been, I've been around for a bit, uh, but officially at 2017. Right. What do you see out there? I mean, how do you do your job? Like, like as far as, you know, you're, 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 it's all science based, but mm -hmm. what do you look for? Uh, and I mean, as far as I mean, I know the aggregation is a little bit a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, than than your normal work, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, yeah. So, what is your normal work? What do you typically do as a scientist? Uh, my job is as a scientist is to look at the fishery through data. So, w how I perceive the fishery, how I do my job, is through looking at numbers, turning mathematizing the the field observations and all that using computer simulation models and all sorts of cool data toys to um really you know look for patterns look for trends and relate that to changes that guides see and changes that we do with management and everything like that yeah, that was my question so it it's first comes from the guides or the yeah. locals and they come to you and say hey i think we have a problem with this and then you're going to take a deeper dive into why and how and yeah, right? yeah. It doesn't all come from you. Like, oh, we need a, you know, we need to look at Western dry rocks. It's, yeah. it's a bigger issue that gets brought to you, correct? Yeah. the the the, frame, the framework how we work, particularly at BTT is that we you know, work hand in hand in partnership with the fishing community down here. So the guides, the anglers, they are they are basically sharks that we can talk to. You know, they have they are very much part of the ecosystem as everything else. So when they see changes, um, as if a shark saw a change, we can talk to the guides. And figure out what what that what would the underlying driver would that be? How can we quantify that? And what does that mean for the sake of the species? You know, I also find interesting is that you know you would think that BTT would just be locally based, mm -hmm. and it, initially it was, but you guys are like in Belize and Bahamas and kind of everywhere. And you also too had all the netting stopped in Cuba. How did that take place? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and why too? I think people yeah. would find that very interesting. So that yeah, the mission of BTT is to conserve the flats fisheries in the Greater Caribbean through science, advocacy, and education. And when we got started, we we wanted to be like Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited, where it's you know very much restoration policy engagement. But we knew nothing about bonefish permit and tarpon, their ecology or their biology. So we. We brought in the science component originally to just to learn what we needed to do in the first place. And that has you know, molded into the, the science-based advocacy and education approach that we take today. So the initial part of BTT was to bring back the bonefish fishery in the Keys that had uh, been undergoing a long decline for instance, about the mid-1990s. 
And we learn through the re reproductive cycle, they spawn in these crazy, this is insane spawning process, like nothing else does this, where they form these aggregations near shore and then they migrate overnight to depths of like a thousand feet of water and they dive down to a couple hundred feet of water and spawn. And the idea behind that is that it can just spread their seed through everywhere, which is great if you live in a place that's like a hurricane zone and, you know, if you're on a tiny little island and it gets decimated, you know, you'll have spring, offspring come to you. But from a conservation perspective, that means like if we want to keep our Keys population going, Cuba's got to have a thriving bonefish population. You know, Belize needs to have one as well. So that's what, that really initialized our work in other and, places. And, and that's because of the Gulf Stream thinking that a lot of the, uh, the larvae are going to come north through the Gulf Stream up to Key West and the Keys? Yeah, yeah. How much? Enough, you know. Um, right. we, did, we, never, we, we lost our spawning stock of bonefish in 2010, and we got bonefish again, so there's obviously a connection there. Um, and now that we have our own population going again, I'm sure we're, we're getting a lot of retention from the spawning sites that we're mapping. Mm -hmm. So it's optimistic for bonefish. It's good time, good time to be alive if you like bonefish. Well, you're talking about the spawning uh, ritual yeah. of bonefish. Tarpon's quite similar too. They, don't they, they gather at the bridges then go offshore and spawn in deep water? Oh, it's exactly the same. Yeah, and every, like the bonefish spawning rhythm here in the Keys is like the same exact thing as tarpon season, but like each spawning event is compressed into like five days. So like the whole routine of migrating oceanside, bonefish do that. Uh, it's more subtle and you got to know what to look for. And then the aggregations near shore, like they do at the bridges. And then these runs offshore. Like there was that video of that guy on the jet ski yeah, that, that ran over a bunch of them a thousand feet of water. It's like freaking can't get away from the damn things. Those jet skis, man. I, <laughs> I did, did hire them. That. <laughs> so, so bonefish migrate similar to tarpon yeah and in the sense that it's or, or the spawn yeah um well it's like you know with the tarpon it's like the so you know i think there's a big social component when they're doing when they're swimming oceanside or you know they're picking up friends they're they're meeting girls and then they kind of congeal at the aggregations and bonefish do the same thing but it's over a much shorter window of time it's not a couple months it's you know a matter of days how often do bonefish spawn uh, they, they will spawn from October to May and they usually take, uh, January and February off. So you have this weird kind of two hump spawning season. And we're kind of, what we're learning this year is that not every bonefish spawns each season. It's actually around 40% of them do, um, which is kind of low. Uh, and it's, it's a lot lower in some areas, which is a conservation concern. I find that, it, that, that statement interesting, only 40% spawn. How do, I mean, how do you find that number, only 40%? So we, we have a bunch of fish tagged, and at least the aggregation we, we found, that we know that um, if they go to that aggregation, they generally spawn. So if they don't go to it, and we know that from the, the detection oh, data. Oh, I see, from the um, tagged fish. And we validated, we built this really cool tag type with this company that just has all this new cool bells and whistles that records like the maximum depth of bonefish swims. So we know we, we validated with like the regular tags that, you know, if one of those fancy tagged fish goes to the aggregation, it goes and spawns. And if it doesn't go to the aggregation, it, it doesn't spawn. So mm -hmm. did you, did you get a sailboat just so you could go and live to study in different locations as a scientist? Yeah. Otherwise, the, uh, you got to stay in a hotel. You can't yeah. keep renting houses in different locations. No. The, or was that a byproduct of just your life? Uh, I was a, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting story. So I, my dad, he when he was my age, he dropped everything, moved to California with my mom, bought a sailboat, and worked for just long enough for him to sail across the Pacific and disappear for three years. So he, he did that and then he ran out of money and then had to come back, uh, which is the reason why I'm born over there. Uh, otherwise, I would have been born in Florida like they were. But um, so, that you know, I was I got the, the, the job out of BTT actually came out of nowhere. I was, um, you know, I, was, I always wanted to be a professor, like academic professor, have my own little lab, do all that cool stuff. And I was doing everything to get there, you know, every grinding benchmark I could. And then BTT just kind of offered me the job out of nowhere. Just said, hey, I got the job for you in the Keys. You want to, uh, do you want it? And I had some interest in universities and stuff. And I was like, shoot. Yeah. He's like, you're going to be working with fishing guides. You're going to be fishing a bunch. Is that cool with you? <laughs> I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I thought about it for like two weeks. And it's like a huge deviation from like a career. I can't, I could, once I took this job, I couldn't go back to academia. 
Um, anyways, I, I decided to take it, but I'm looking around in the keys and like, well, you know, I don't, what, how do I want to live? How do I, how do, what do I want to do down here? And I, I knew the sailing was good. You know, it's got, we get good prevailing winds out of the east. Uh, I knew there was really cool anchorages around here. You can, you can, if you had a shallow draft boat, you can kind of go anywhere. And so I thought about it and then I started looking at boats for sale. And my dad, he cruised around with this guy that had the same boat that I first bought. This, uh, it's a Jim Brown trimaran. They're, uh, these wooden, beautiful boats. He's like, oh, that boat's really cool. If you can get that boat, you should buy it. So, uh, long story short, I got it. And, uh, you know, until you own a boat, you don't really know what anything, you, what you know, you what you have. Yeah. Or like, you, you, lo you know, less than nothing. So, you know, it's that, that first year of owning something is always the most dangerous. And, um, so yeah, I pulled the trigger on it and, you know, learned, learned how to rebuild diesel engines, rig sailboats, wire, you know, all the electrical stuff you need to do. And, and that journey has been really fun. You know, it's the, the adventure at every step of the way, maintaining the boat and then, you know, being free to go wherever you want, whenever you want, more right. or less, you know, like I have just as much fun sailing, you know, cause I normally am in marathon and I'm just up in Miami just for, um, this is recent research we've been doing. Um, but yeah, going just anchoring behind off the content keys for a weekend. That's just as much fun for me as it would be to, you know, book a trip to Mexico and right. deal with all that. So, right. uh, was, what was the learning curve life to become a scientist? To become a scientist? Yeah. To work underwater. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, uh, at marine biology, particularly for the good jobs is super competitive. It's like, you know, it's as hard as anything to do, but the good thing is it's like formulaic, you know, if you do all the things right and you're better than everybody else at it, you're going to get the job you want. So, um, what are the good jobs? You mentioned good jobs. Good jobs would be working in a, a system or a place that you like, you want to live in. Like, you know, there's always jobs in Kansas and stuff sure, where sure. you're like, you know, waiting around a mud pog pond for frogs and stuff. But like the, the good jobs, yeah. like working for BTT. What or, you're interested in. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. So I, I just kind of had that mentality and, you know, basically didn't do anything else in my twenties, but study and research and everything like that. So, um, the learning curve, it's just, you know, it's a grind and it just, you know, self just complete commitment to, uh, your graduate studies early on. And then hopefully it pays off at the end. Because I would think that that learning curve, you're not really sure what you're looking for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. You um, know, like, okay, so I want to be a, marine biologist and you studied all that but you didn't study marine biology did you fishery science okay same yeah same thing same wavelength so then at least you have an idea what you're looking for yeah um when you say looking for what do you mean well you know as far as when you go out there um like, like on the water trying to do yeah when, stuff? You're, when you're on the water you're not really sure where to go to find stuff yeah. you know how do i find where these fish live how do i find where they travel uh where they slide like western dry rocks that i would think that, that would be somewhat relatively easy because it's a big reef where fish go to uh but like the aggregation you were talking about the other the other night where you found a school of two thousand bonefish going offshore and spawning yeah. i mean my god how'd you find that yeah that was so yeah, to, to back up, you know, part of our, one of the projects we have is to you know learn about the ecology of these fish. And the one thing for bonefish, you know, we kind of knew where their juveniles were. We know where the, the habitats they live as adults, but their, their spawning sites has been this mystery. So we, we put together a project where, you know, we basically just grabbing at clues and just attack and investigating them with scientific tools. And we relied on guides to tell us like basically when they saw bonefish just do weird things. Um, and what would that rep be like? I mean, I remember fishing tournaments in April, mm -hmm. you'd see big uh, wads of bonefish racing down the shoreline. Like that, yeah. Um, so there, th th those were clues and that's actually a clue that paid off um, th those sightings back then. Back then. Um, just, and more recently, like if I saw some guy catch like three eight pound bonefish in a day and like, the lower keys, you know, I instantly message him. I'm like, Hey, can you tell me where you were? You know, general location. And, um, I swear I won't fish those spots. I'm yeah. A yeah. So. Like, I don't care about, I mean, I'd be cool to catch one, but yeah, just like, you know, it's anything that yeah, yeah. like, and that what, was unusual. And, yeah. What tide? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you go on this side of the flat or this side? You know, that's um, funny. Why is it, uh, yeah. So 
differences. I mean, finding fish that are doing different things. Yeah. Why is it important to find a, a bonefish aggregation? It's important for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, you, if you don't know where it is, you don't know anything, what the threats they may face. Um, you just don't know anything. You're just with this big uncertainty. Uh, when we went into that study, you know, I was totally expecting it to be like they have in the Bahamas. We're kind of these knots of bone fish that are, I mean, they're, they're big, but not like, you know, the, the, the meat, I guess. And that there was something about them that kept them invisible or hard enough to find where guides would or anglers would come up them occasionally, you know, they get a couple. And as far as we'd have to go on that side would be just like monitor it. And, you know, if we see so, you know, make sure the word got out, like that was our aggregations. Don't, you know, don't get greedy, just catch a couple fish and move on. Um, but as we found, as we discovered and uh, it's actually kind of now worrisome is where it is. There's a reason why it's been invisible. It's that uh, they've done a good job of hiding themselves. But uh, as our population recovers and grows, it's 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 not going to be invisible for long. People are going to find it. And then when they do, they're going to figure out how to fish it. And then a fishery is going to develop for them. How deep of water are they? Uh, they're somewhere, without giving too much away, uh, about 20 feet to 50 feet. They kind of use that, that mm -hmm. zone on the reef. And they move around and... Um, Right. But it's a predictable enough area that, uh, you know, like someone who has way better fishing than me uh, could figure it out, figure out how to effectively find them, catch them, and then, you know, offer a bucket list trip. Yeah, we, we were talking to uh, uh, Albert uh, Panzola mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, and he was talking about Western dry rocks. I mm -hmm. brought it up because I find that, you know, Albert is not only a fly fisherman believing in conservation, but he's also yeah. a commercial fisherman. Most people believe uh, that closing Western dry rocks was just imperative because that's a, a, a spawning location for, for permit. Mm -hmm. But he was against it. It's like, how do you convince um, the masses don't fish? Like in Colorado, you, you're not allowed. It's so unethical to fish over uh, beds with rainbow yeah. trout. You know, don't fish the reds. How do we change that, that thinking process um, for bonefish permit and the, and the fish that are in the ocean? It's all marine fish. It's, it's insane how, how that has not translated. Like I was talking to a scientist over in Ireland and the government bought them a fleet of high-end boats to fish this one area they couldn't access. And that area was a big spawning ground for Orange Ruffy. So the government bought them the boats. They went out there. Uh, you know, more or less fished it, eradicated that aggregation, and then sold the boats and made money. So, like, it, you know, a government-funded project to really ruin, you know, wreck this fishery. Right. And, uh, even at that level, you know, that's still going on. So I don't, I don't know why these these special moments, these special times that these fish should absolutely be left alone. Like how that is not, you know, translated into more of the marine world. Right. Um, I know the guys next door, they're out there catching these monster yeah, mites. I was just about to for, say that, yeah. You know, they're on the reef spawning right now, and they're going out every day bringing home fish this big. Yeah. Why do you have to bring home 20 of them? Is that 20? pretty unethical in the community down here? The fish spawning aggregations? Well, yeah, mutton snapper in particular right now. You know, it's so ingrained in the community, and right. I, I don't want to speak for the offshore fleet, but I, I know uh, some of the people that I talk to, you know, they hate it, but they have to do it. Um, and it's just kind of the idea of all of everywhere, everybody else is doing it. I'm going to do it. Like the, the mangrove spawn in July is kind of the same way. Um, and it's just unfortunate too, because yeah, you can catch a lot of fish during those aggregation periods and yeah, they're big and that's cool and it's predictable. You can sell trips way in advance, but like if you they're did, ma they're making more fish. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. Fi the fishery would be so much better year yeah. round, you know? Sure. Um, so I, if there was something in the world I could change would be like that mentality. And so uh, let's go back to the spawning aggregation that you found. Why, uh -huh. why is that so important to know where they are? Could it also give you an idea about the population that, yeah. we, that we have available? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, one of the core questions, particularly for bonefish, and is that as we think about optimizing our investments, you know, conservation investments everywhere, is how much of our bonefish population is our own like how mm -hmm. much of our spawning biomass recruits here grows up here and lives and dies here uh you know evolution basically tries to make that happen at all costs like salmon have taken it too far 
And now they've gotten all sorts of issues where, you know, they actively go to the river and spawn and die in it uh, to enhance their, uh, you know, self-retention and, you know, population. So the idea is that it's likely that bonefish are trying to do that here. And the question is how much of it does stay. So by mapping these spotting sites at the first level, we can, we can reevaluate ocean current models and see how much retention we actually have and how much control of our population we have locally versus, you know, leaving it to the fate of somebody else. Um, the next level is water quality. Uh, you know, like spawning is a luxury. You know, if you think about it, like money for humans, like your, your first priority with your money is to like live, you know, rent, food, water. Uh, if you have enough of it, then you can start buying stuff on disposable income, you know, start trying to pick up chicks and, you know, all that stuff. And then if you get enough, you know, you can raise a family. And fish is the same way, but it's energy, you know? They, uh, the first priority is to live, not be eaten, to grow. And then if they can take care of all that, then they'll reproduce. So when you think about water quality stresses, like the first thing that's going to go is the reproductive effort or the reproductive quality of fish, because that's a luxury. It's luxury. That's disposable income for them. Um, so if we look at that, you know, that that's a good indicator of what water quality could be doing, particularly if we think about some of the contaminants like PFAS, pharmaceuticals, and all this other nasty crap we're putting in the water. Um, so we have that level by identifying the spawn, we can kind of look at water quality issues uh, at the uh, of the fish that are spawning versus the fish are not. And there's something there to that. And we need to investigate it further, but um, I think there's definitely an a, a, a interesting linkage or important linkage that we're hoping to uh, further evaluate. And this, the third thing is, of course, fishing, fishing pressure. You know, this is an aggregation. It's a, you know, what we saw would be a very attractive thing for people to fish for. Uh, I mean, there were some very, very big bonefish in there. And why we don't see those on the flats, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've been losing sleep over it, Andy, actually, to be honest with you. Like now that we discovered it, you know, like, am I going to be the harbinger of doom of this place? Because um, the wrong person ended up finding out or, or am I going to be its protector? You know, right. uh, why was it so important to tell people that you found it? I, I, I think the importance of it is to, to substantiate your, your job and what BTT is doing is like, we found this. It's optimistic. You know, I think there's a lot to it. There's, you know, it's optimism. Right. Um, you know, our population's recovering. They can spawn again. I think it's good to let the policymakers know where it is and how it is and that people are excited about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I think justify your research and try yeah. to help raise money for, there, there's some of that, you know, but if that was the only thing we could control that, um, I mean, the people that would be giving a lot of money to this project, you know, they, they'd be okay with not knowing. Right. Um, so I, I the fundraising side of it is, you know, it's probably the lesser of just, yeah. you know, raising awareness that these exist, um, letting policy makers know that these exist and then actions need to be taken potentially. So, yeah, I, I can see all of the above, but also too, it will create enthusiasm yeah. for everybody who are fishing for these great fish that we do have a population and it is growing. Yeah. It's optimism, man. Like how cool, like we haven't had yeah. a spawning stock locally. For I so remember many years. when the video was, was being played last night, you pointed at one fish, look, that's, tw that's a 20 pound bone <laughs> fish. <laughs> I know it's it so, was cool to see all those big fish because you may not see them on the flats, but they're they're there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, some secret reservoir population that we've had. Who knows for how long? Um, so let me ask you this: This might be a stupid question, but you might have the the research and data to back it up. So if you catch a bonefish, have you caught a bonefish in like say a Biscayne Bay area and tagged it and seen it come down to Alamrata, maybe Marathon, yeah, and worked its way down? Yeah. Um, we actually tagged a really big one, uh, the biggest one of the study. Um, you know, the the length weight estimate put it at around twelve pounds. Uh, crazy, you know, it was so lucky. We uh, wind was blowing, it was nuts. Uh, a big storm was coming in, so we just threw two shrimp on a jig head, and we're just dragging behind the boat, thinking about what we're gonna do. And both rods go off, and one was this huge bonefish. Wow. Um, and that that was actually a repeatable thing we could do to get tags out. Uh, for like two months and that hasn't existed since, but it's a uh, eight feet of water, random, you know, kind of location. Eight, eight feet of water. Yeah. And, and that was in Biscayne Bay. That was in Biscayne. Yeah. And where did you see it go? Uh, went down last saw to like, look like Shell Key area. 
Um, so maybe it's living in a channel down there now. Right. Hasn't come back up. Uh, and we've had fish from Big Pine come up to Biscayne Bay. So I, I think they're oh, a little bit cool. more mobile yeah. than what we previously thought. And whether that's because it's a recovering population and this is like, you know, they're trying to fill out areas that are, mm -hmm. that are the best or they've always done it and just, you know, it's been kind of cryptic, you know. Right. You ever see fish go to like Bahamas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had one. Uh, well, now three now. Three. Um, and I, I suspect it's going to be more. We have a paper in review that uh, soon to be published. But uh, the craziest thing about that was that one fish was tagged at Crandon with a dart tag. Another fish was tagged uh, off the Arsenickers. Um, uh, not not Biscayne. Oh, she yeah, no. Uh, Right. Isla Mirada, the Arsnickers around there, I think. I, okay. I, yeah. And then uh, the one I put an acoustic transmitter one was in a uh, little Spanish. Despite that That's being crazy. like, you know, 160 mile difference or kilometer difference, they went to the exact same spot in, in the, the Bahamas and Andros. All like, those tagged fish did. 10, yeah, 10 kilometers apart from where, despite them being tagged like a million miles apart over, you know, a 15 That's year period. Like, That's crazy. It's insane. Do you think possibly those fish were born in the Bahamas, ended up in the in the states, in the Keys, and ended up going back after they were tagged, like a salmon like a in salmon. Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just wondering. They went back to the same spot, or maybe they're spawning over there and going to head back. You know, I yeah, because where where that you know where if the if you kind of because with the the acoustic tagged fish we actually have the the movement path of where it went right. with the the dart tagged fish it was just a point A to point B, so it looked like it was going to that spawning site kind of near uh, in the central Andros area, uh, but it, they were both all three of them going through the middle bites and um, man what that means I don't I mean I don't know but it's cool that means is. Their fish is our, our fish, yeah. and our fish are their fish. Well, you know, when BTT first got started, one of the initial questions that really uh, made everybody's uh, attention come to focus was when Billy Pate was talking about tarpon. And I think, it was, you know, the, the migratory route through Mexico, Louisiana, into the Keys, he said, are our fish their fish, and their fish our fish? And that gave reason to start a conservation group, BTT, so you can go in other regions and say, hey, man, we need to save these fish. Because as everybody knows, like in Belize, catch and releases were worth like $86 million a year yeah. to that country. So that's mostly why I think initially people wanted to save tarpon because they knew that those, those tarpon that they were killing and, and using as fertilizer in Mexico could have been our fish swimming on our beaches. And didn't they think those bigger tarpon, like Homosassa area, came from Africa or something? Uh, no, but we're all thinking that there's... You tell me. Is that total BS? Because, because the, the tarpon in Africa are all so big. Is that a different uh, gene pool? The the best we can say is there there is genetic similarity between the tarpon in Africa and in Florida. Uh, but that doesn't... To get genetic similarity, that doesn't take much with an 80, 90-year-old right. animal. You know, you just need a couple of them every couple of years to find their way across the Atlantic, and then then you'd have that similarity. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, there, there's some connectivity, and it can't go. I, there's, I forget what way it can't go, but it can't, I think it can't come back from Africa to us without a, an adult tarpon, you know, right. moving its body this way, if that makes sense. Because mm. obviously tarpon grow to what, 80 years? Yeah, yeah. Maybe our fish just can't, don't have a chance to grow that old. So they don't have a chance to get that big. There's not a lot of people fishing for them in Gabon. Is there not? Have you been over there? No, but I can't imagine. I can't imagine Gabon looking like South Florida right now. <laughs> <laughs> skiffs everywhere. Yeah, skiffs everywhere. I've got friends that fish over there and they, they hook monster fish for sure. Um, what about this big uh, sargasm grass bed in off of Africa that's 5,000 miles long and it's coming our way? Yeah. Have you guys thought about that? We have. Uh, we have a couple studies. This, this permit study that we're just getting started will um, we'll provide us a good snapshot of what that does to the food web. Because um, what we may see is uh, when all that stuff starts washing in in the short term, it's like the permit just end up loving it, you know? 
uh, and they can pick off all the critters off there and which may be pulling them off the flats or something. Um, and that in the short term, you may see these kind of animals shift around. We knew there was a slug of it that came into Biscayne Bay that we were monitoring and it, um, washed up against on the seagrass flat, rotted and killed all the seagrass underneath it. Um, so as these things start pushing in, you know, we'll have these habitat level effects where it kills our grass in it certain could, places. They kill mangroves too, don't they? I bet it could, yeah. That's what I was reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a big pile of weeds. Yeah, yeah. 5,000, it's the width of, it's like one and a half times the size of the United States in width, 5,000 miles, it's crazy. Um, yeah. What does your information and the common fishermen need to know as far as you know what our work is doing Mm -hmm. and what can the common man do to help uh instill what we have uh, as a fishery long term that's a great question um to fix our i mean don't get me wrong you know i i think the fishing in florida is still pretty cool it's just hurting, you know, it's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of fun to be had on the water. There's bonefish that are coming back, you know, permit are still around in places. And then, you know, I think, I think that's going to sort itself out soon. Um, tarpon, well, I'm a little more concerned about them in the long term, but you know, they've been around since before the dinosaurs. So, you know, if, if humans with hook and rods and, you know, boogie whips and or buggy whips and stuff drive them to extinction that'd be insane that's not gonna happen no no but you know but the going back to that so there's three things that we need to all of us as a community and btt we're working on all three need to address you know we need to address the habitat issues uh fix mangroves fix creeks fix seagrass beds keep boats from running them off we need to fix the water quality and that's you know everglades restoration that's you know bringing, revitalizing our wastewater and infrastructure that's been basically ignored since the seventies, um, before, you know, many of the chemicals that we use today and at daily life were even existed. Um, and last we need to address fisheries issues, uh, whether that's the, the shark, the emerging shark issue, uh, aggregation overfishing, um, and then handling practices and all that. And so as as we think about all of this as anglers and guides and the community, you know, all three are important and we need to do what we can to address all three collectively. Um, The other part of that is like catch and release fishing is so new. It's like you don't learn about it in textbooks. Like you learn that you have a fishery, it's going to kill them out of a, a bunch of fish. And you have to figure out what's the optimization, how many can you kill to keep the population going? And under that, it's called maximum sustainable yield. You kill about half the population and then, the, you know, you'll have enough to re- recover a good amount of the population each year. But with like catch and release fishing, it's like, what do you, where's your optimization, you know? Like, do we want to have half the population down so it can replenish itself? Um, you know, that's, that's a bunch of small bone fish in the Keys. That's probably no permit on the flats. Um, do we want to have a, what is, do we have an optimization for big bone fish permit on the flats, you know, swimming tarpon and all that. So we got to think, and then like, how do you, with that thinking about the optimization, then you got to think about what can you do? Like we can't regulate take cause no one's killing them. Um, so we have to think about the behavior of anglers and guides and those are completely unenforceable. You know, you can't set a regulation and that's effective to like keep a bonefish in the water. So it really is going to fall on the angling community to like think about what the fishery that they want is, you know, and like, how do we, how do we move there? You know, if you see a bunch of bonefish, catch one and move on, you know, or catch, catch a couple, don't take as many photos with bonefish as you, you know, don't take a photo of every single fish you catch, you, you know, things like that. And the, the little mm-hmm. discipline that we can instill on ourselves to kind of like common sense, but yeah, common sense is hard to, hard to, uh, hard to find when you get so excited exactly and you work so hard to get onto a flat and yeah. you start catching a bunch of fish you know I, I get that yeah so um yeah i think it's a lot of it's a catch and release and then you know really considering all all, all of the cumulative issues that that are, are you know that our fishery reserve right what yeah. about sharks i mean is that a big of problem as you know many guides we we speak about you know we speak to they say the shark predation is a huge problem yeah i mean like I, I think the first, the message that really gets lost in the sharks 
is like the first is the optimism. Like their sharks were like, most of these shark species were critically endangered, like on the verge of extinction. And through like- How many years ago? Like 30 years ago. Like, so that was when they had long liners here. Yeah. And then like the Jaws movie came out and then the other, you know, the kill, catch and kill wreck fishery took off. So we were able to bring that fishery back to a point now that it's causing, you know, causing problems to other fisheries. So I think that's cool, you know, in the first level of it, that stuff works, you know? Right. Um, the second part of it, you know, it's, uh, now we have this problem, like, what do you, what do we do? You know? know, um, it's not only we have more sharks, but those damn things are smart, man. Like, you know, they know boats now. Like, yeah, they know motors. Yeah. They, sh they pull up and they turn that motor off. It's the dinner bill is, is being yeah. one. So um, like, they're, they're talking about, this is a Bahia Hunter mm -hmm. or, or Seven Mile. You kill one shark and hang it from, a, you know, uh, from the pile in there. All the sharks go away. Is that true? It's species specific. I, I, I've no doubt. I've heard that enough from enough people that it works for bull sharks. Um, so only bull sharks, that's when you say species specific? Yeah, yeah. Really? Uh, and they've done studies other places. So where, hammerheads will still come in? Uh, from my understanding, yes. Interesting. Uh, I haven't killed a hammerhead and hung yeah, it from sure. a bridge or like, you know, right. seen it myself. But uh, I, I, I've heard, you know, I know for lemon sharks, like it doesn't work. Like if you you kill a lemon shark and hang it from a bridge, just other lemon sharks just start eating it. Uh, <laughs> so like- um, Very interesting. And, and if any of that kind of stuff, it's it's like it, the sharks are going to figure out what that this, you know, the dead bull shark from the bridge is probably a non-threat. Um, and, you know, it's just like a dog. They'll learn. Yeah. That is a neutered dog that knows there's like, you know, a, a dog in heat over there. Mm -hmm. And all he's got to do is run through that electrical fence and get a little prick, you know. And then everybody talks about the uh, the light line guys in Key West. They're losing 50 percent of uh, of what they hook to yeah. sharks. 50 percent. And it's like the. I, I just, that's just, un, it blows my mind that you're going to go out there, hook a fish, and you're going to lose half of them to sharks. And everybody's doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I feel for the guides and, you know, a light tackle inshore. Like and, they, the, and the fishery yeah. too. Is there an answer? I mean, is this, a, is this, or does this represent a healthy ocean? I don't think so. I think it represents a ocean with, declining habitat and declining water quality and in essence declining forage like in a natural system like a bull shark is rarely going to get a permit like i mean they will you for sure but it's like that you know it, it wants to eat stingrays it wants to eat mullet it doesn't you know a permit's too much too much effort um so for them to you know be targeting them now and keying in on all that stuff i, I think that's a sign of just like the ecosystem is not able to support the predator biomass that's been created. Um, so I think that's one hand of it. Uh, what can we do? I, you know, I think we need to look at shark deterrence, pretty give a shark deterrent a hard look. Uh, it's going to be a short term temporary thing. The sharks will inevitably get wise to it and that won't work anymore, but it'll buy us time. What's um, the, what's the a shark deterrent? Like the, you know, there's people at Key West community college that are, uh, you know, it, trying to scale up that stuff with a bull shark smell, the dead bull shark smell and like make that into capsules. Right. Okay. Like uh, bear Holman has a funny story where they gave him like a trial one. And I, I forget he was, but there was some pro process where he had to like either pull the pen and then throw it or, or throw it with the pin still in. But anyways, he ended up just blasting his whole face with just like rotten shark. Oh, <laughs> it got stuck in his beard. Um, there's a shark shield has come up with a cool, cool technology that you can hang from a back of it. It's meant for back of a sailboat that mm -hmm. connects to your battery. It gives you like a 75 foot, a kind of a electromagnetic barrier. Uh, I, we were talking back in January with uh, Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association to see if they would be willing to you know, buy a couple and test them out. Cause in Florida Bay, that could work. That could be really good for snook and redfish mm -hmm. for tarpon. It's not going to, you know, 75 feet. It's not going to give you enough time. Right. Um, or permit or bonefish. But uh, you know, I, I think, as the demand for that kind of product keeps going up, you know, like someone's going to figure something out that works for at least a little while. Um, then I think we, you know, like we need to figure out how to like, 
you know, keep, yeah, you know, like spawning aggregations. You know, like that's a place that attracts a lot of sharks and like shouldn't be fishing that. You know, like and think about strategic area closures that are in places where that are important for the biology of the fish and are also resulting in a lot of these depredation, post-release predation. Um, you know, if it's like if it's just a small percentage of sharks that have just learned mm -hmm. maybe culling, I don't know, you know, I'll have to see some more information on that to be convinced. Um, but yeah, so you need to like break the negative experience with sharks for sure. Uh, or and break the positive experience they get with right. boats, you know? Right. right. Um, what about the, you know, we're coming in, it's May, full moon and new moon creates worm hatches mm -hmm. in that low tide. What do you think about the palola worm? What's your take on that as, a, as opposed to like how important it is for the tarpon? That's crazy, man. Those things are nuts for them. Uh, why? Like, I, I you know, I, I we have, uh, thanks to you guys, we have some worms and we're going to run a macronutrient analysis on them. Uh, and I think they they really like them. And I, the hypothesis is that as the, the, the nutrient makeup of a worm is like going to be very, very similar to the nutrient makeup of an egg, a tarpon egg. So, and what that means is that like when it consumes it, it's like going straight to egg production. So they get this last kind of big gully full of food that can go straight to making sure their eggs are healthy right before they go. It's, yeah, that's so funny because we're always hearing it. They thought it was an aphrodisiac. The fish get high from eating these things. And, and we were always thinking over the last few years, it's got to be something about it, the reproduction, because after that full moon, they go offshore and spawn. Yeah. There's got to be a connection to the, to the eggs and, and, and to the spawning you know, ritual. I, I would think so. Um, yeah, I, but they do, you know, there's like crab flushes that they time their spawn with in Boca Grande and Egmont Key. Um, Easy food. Yeah. Where it, I mean, they're not going to get the same kind of benefit they would from, you know, 10 pounds or 20 pounds of worms in their belly as they were, well, you know, a bunch of shells and stuff right. like that. Why don't tarpon go west from Bahia Honda Bridge? Or as many as that come to Bahia Honda from, you know, the east? You know better than I would, man. I don't got an answer for you. Why do you <laughs> it's think? Like, it's like Ponzola said, you cannot fit another tarpon at Bahia Honda Bridge. I said... And they get stuck. There's like a gate right there yeah. and, and a small percentage to go down to Key West, et cetera. But between Bahia Honda and Ocean Reef, there is a highway of fish. And it's crazy how they want to stay above Bahia Honda. It's just that deep channel that congregates fish and they can, uh, you're the scientist. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of food down there for yeah. sure. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but it's weird. I mean, Key West used to have a lot of fish. I mean, they made movies about it in the, in the 70s and stuff. So it's um, why why that fishery is kind of doing this, you know, here in the Keys. Punzola and, and, uh, and some of these guys like Dustin Huff, they have not seen the biomass they used to see in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, he used to say out of and all these banks, you'd go out there in February and just see a, a massive fish, like thousands of fish, and he's not seeing it anymore. Although during COVID, Dustin said he was out there and he saw the biomass again. Um, but they haven't seen it in the last number of years. Do you have any feel for the numbers game, the biomass that is no longer in the Gulf? That's a great question. and And it comes down to like this catch and release thing that we have, like it's not like tarpon have a choice, you know, like they don't have to be in the keys. Uh, they don't have to be in the flats. They could, they could be just as fine in hundred feet of water and probably live a lot of their life out there. So how much, how much harassment can they take from boats running them over? How much, you know, water quality changes in that mm -hmm. neck of the woods can they change, take before they just, you know, give up? Just don't go there. Yeah. So, and that place is weird because it doesn't get that much boat traffic, you know? Um, right. It, it's a good flow way of water from Florida Bay. So, uh, but that, from him, his description of it, that that changed well before the seagrass die off. Um, I remember we used to go out there and, and just see so many fish. And yeah. you, you still see them uh, a little bit further to the north. But down in the lower keys, uh, I haven't seen them in a long time. But those guys go out there every year, and they say they are gone. But Fordyce also said that um, 
where the water is released out of out of ponds a lot of times he's seen a lot of fish don't get down into the keys they kind of, there's kind of a barrier there because there may be bad water that's being flushed out you know on that falling tide have you guys tested that water up in that area the the water coming out of ponds and by extension shark river i mean that's going to be as about as clean as it could get uh you know if rob is seeing something that you know he again he's like a predator right you know, and I, I trust what he if he's seeing water that looks different there probably is something different about it but you know just based off the water quality standards we have to get water into the park like that's been a major barrier to restoration was you know because we had to clean the water we have to clean the water before it gets down into the shark slough and into right. the shark river so I, I would be surprised if there's some hypernutrient water coming out. I mean, it can come out of Florida Bay, you know, right. uh, and you can see it on satellite imagery. Um, I mean, the other, the other thing is it's maybe that the keys has stayed the same, but just yeah, Ponce has all of a sudden got a lot more productive. I mean, we've mm -hmm. had seven or eight years of really good rainfall in the, both the summer and in the winter. So maybe that hydration is, you know, doing something good for the tarpon in the Everglades. They want to stay up yeah. in that area. Why, why leave? Yeah. Right. Talk a little bit about that study that came out a couple months ago, maybe a year ago, that you guys found pharmaceuticals in the bonefish bloodstream, correct? And now in, in redfish as well in Tampa Bay and the West Coast? How does that happen? Yeah, um, it happens because the, the main problem is because our wastewater treatment was built in the 70s um, before any pharmaceuticals were really invented or PFAS were really a thing. And so the, 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 the main culprit is that our, our wastewater treatment facilities just don't clean them up. So it's just in the water. Yeah. And when we take them, you know, our body processes like a, a very small percentage of them. I, I don't know the exact number offhand. So we end up excreting a lot of excess, ex, excess, or excess pharmaceuticals into the water that are unprocessed and they go directly into our marine systems. So and how we kind of, we didn't come out of this out of thin air. We... Part of a study we had prior to that to learn about the physiology behind bonefish spawning, we had bonefish in tanks. We had there's bonefish in the Bahamas in tanks and then bonefish in the Keys in tanks. And the bonefish in the Bahamas in the tanks, you could just walk in the tanks and they'd swim around, you know, you know, they hand feed them, you know, it's totally didn't even bother by the human presence. But in the you know, the Keys fish, if you like flipped on a light or like bang something in that room. The fish would just go nuts and inevitably kill themselves by swimming into the walls. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. So um, as we were like, what now? What is this? You know, we're, they're testing the water in the tanks for all these different things. And then Jen Rehage, the scientist that's on, on the BTT board, she's like, I, I, you know, I met the, I know this researcher in Sweden. He he runs pharmaceutical analysis, and this seems like a weird behavioral thing that would be like a kind of a cause from a weird drug. Do you mind if I send him some samples? So she sent him some samples and they came back like off the charts on all these different drugs. And uh, so much so they're like, we need can you get us a few more because they don't look, this seems too high to be what you're saying it is. And this another batch came back and it was the same thing. So we scaled it up and then um, that work found that more or less every single bonefish had been exposed to one pharmaceutical. And when I, there's exposure and then like effects, you know, like- right. If you smoke weed 30 days ago, it may still be in your system, but you know, you're not high. Um, uh, but so we had fish that were exposed and then we had about 50% of them that were feeling the effects of those drugs. So like they, they were, they were high by the time they were wow, sampled. Wow. That's crazy yeah. that there's so much in their system that it would actually f affect their behavior. Yeah. Could you tell what pharmaceutical was more prevalent in their body? And their body, yeah, the a big one was antidepressants, and that's kind of uh, in Sweden. Our colleagues have done a lot of work on that. And when you expose a fish to antidepressants, or yeah, they you know more or less kind of lose their fear of predators, become more aggressive, more antisocial, and, and their long term survival gets really low. Um, and so much so that in salmon, when they migrate. Like they all die if the ones that were dosed with a uh, antidepressant. Um, and then there were some, you know, it's kind of the standard ones that people take. There was like joint medication in there, um, heart medication, and then some really, some strange ones, um, like some antipsychotics that were there. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Um, but it was Jen that kind of put two and two together. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Just, she's like, I know a guy, you know, it's just, you know, and it turns out that's a very pervasive contaminant in our system. Uh, yeah, they tested the food. It's in the food. So what about tarpon and permit? Uh, so tarpon a hundred percent, uh, permit a hundred percent. But, um, we have some theories now that because bonefish and tarpon are just like so evolutionarily old that they just have no capacity to get rid of these things. So they accumulate, they may accumulate a lot more in their bodies than like say redfish, which is kind of an evolutionarily new critter, um, that may just have a little bit more ability to get rid of them. Not, not to say it's not affecting them, but you know, they're not stuck with it for however long bonefish may be. So, uh, and then it's going to be in the sharks for sure. Like it's going to be in like everything. So we think about these shark issues now, like how much, you know, like what level is just, you know, them being just cracked out causing them to like, you know, you know, be so aggressive all the time. Chewing on bridges. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, wow. So yeah, going back to the bonefish reproduction, like there's a part, you know, this, the the aggregation we found, you know, it's the conglomerate of Isla Mirada, Key Largo, um, Biscayne Bay, and we've tagged fish in each node. Um, but the fish in the West side of Biscayne Bay that particularly the ones that kind of overlap where there's so our septic systems, like their spawning efforts, like 10%. And those fish are bigger fish. Like, so the question is how much of these drugs, and that's something we're going to investigate, like are essentially sterilizing these bonefish um, and causing them their spawning effort to be way lower than it should be. Interesting. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's uh, hmm. kind of, uh, it's a new, new kind of lead. And, um, but yeah. The work you guys, you guys do, the spectrum is so vast. It's crazy. Yeah. What's th- your, what's the greatest success you think of BTT? I think the greatest success of B. I I mean, there's, there's a lot, um, internationally, the state parks in the Bahamas. It's great. You know, yeah. working with the Belizeans to, you know, move away from commercial fishing to more, you know, recreational. Did you guys start that where all those, uh, the three species is a game fish, no one can kill a bonefish, permit, or tarpon? Is that correct? Uh, we contributed to it. I, I don't, can't answer for certain if we did, but I know we played a big role in that. You know, I, I, don't, right. I think it may be a matter of like who had the idea first. Um, right. But certainly we were, we were a driving force behind that. Um, for me, I, I think, you know, the biggest accomplishment is definitely for me, Western dry rocks, that, that place. Um, I, yeah. And I do feel for the people that fish out there. Like, you know, I talked to a couple people that like, they cried, you know, when they thought about the idea of closing it because their dad took them there, their grandfather took them there, you know, it's just this cultural and ingrained, ingrained in the culture, but like, right. um, but I, I think that that's going to pay off big time. The, you know, the protection of this multi-species aggregation that forms right on top, you know, that's right next to a big gyre that promotes retention. And I think we're going to start seeing the benefits of that. Whether There's also like 12, I think, other species that spawn there. Yeah. Besides the, the permit. Yeah. The, uh, the big, the big five, I guess would be permit, um, mutton snapper, mangrove snapper, black grouper. And then there's a couple other snapper species, but the, you know, the four managed ones are those. Sure. Um, and then, yeah, so I think, you know, probably in short order, we're going to see more muttons on the flats. You know, I think the permit population is going to, you know, once it's going to start going up again, you know, and I mean, the goal for me is to like me going out, not knowing much in 10 years time, be able to go once every three trips and see a 10 pound bone fish and then, you know, have pretty average 10 shot days of permit and then like catch tarpon when I feel like it. So if we that, can, that's your goal. That's my goal in the next 10 years. I like that goal. Yeah, I do too. Um, yeah. How can people donate to BTT? Uh, you can donate by going to our website, bonefishtarpentrust.org. Um, and, and then they and then just click the donate now button. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, we, not only do we do science that we talked about quite a bit, but we, you know, we're very engaged in policy, uh, at this new legislative session that just came out, you know, we were at a big hand in getting a hundred million dollars to Indian river lagoon restoration, um, you know, 20 million to Biscayne, uh, and then all sorts of all that great stuff that's happening with Everglades restoration. So, um, yeah, we have the policy side, we have education campaigns and also the science to inform, you know, all of that stuff. So it, 
I, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this organization. And like, it's, it's, it's just so cool to see us develop and continue. Now I just got to get jet skis off the flats is the next, <laughs> next goal of the next four years. Pontoon I know. Boats. I've, I've Pontoon always, boats. I know I've always been a, a big advocate of uh, what you guys have done. And I travel a little yeah. bit, as you know, and raise money for BTT and, uh, all we can do is do the best we can to, to preserve our, our fisheries and, and the habitat and, and wage, wage, wage onward. But without the work of you uh, and the other scientists, your work, uh, there's no substance. There's no base for, you know, you bring the knowledge to the table. And I appreciate uh, and speak on behalf of all the other guys out there that, that do this for it's a big part of our hearts and a big part of a lot of the people's lifestyles, you know. Thank you very much. And the mad know, keep, fish scientist. <laughs> keep, thanks so much it, for us. Really appreciate it, buddy. Keep yeah. up the great work, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. No, I thank you guys for your support and you know, you you're doing a great job raising awareness of our fisheries issues and all that. So, you know, it's this collective effort and we're all arms of it. So yeah, we're all in. Thanks yeah. so much, Ross. All right. When I saw it's West Side story. Well, so it's just alright.